Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria and Easton Antique Arms of course. And I often get asked uh, in regards to military swords, that's right, we're back on 19th century military swords today. Um, I often get asked, what's my perfect sword, my, my perfect model? And uh, you know, kind of, I love swords and I own lots of them. Obviously I've got about 150 swords in my collection and I buy and sell swords all the time. Um, and so I don't, I almost don't have to sort of uh, pin my colours to one particular one. I don't have to commit. Uh, I can be a bit of a floozy when it comes to swords because one day I might like this one, the next day I might like the next one. So I'm not a one sword man, so to speak. But there are certain swords which obviously I'm drawn to, certain designs of swords. Now, not talking about non-regulation swords here because obviously that gets into a whole complex kind of world but talking about regulation patterns there is a model of sword which i am a big fan of um in certainly for the british military swords and there are there are obviously models of swords from france and austria and other places that i love as well but looking at the british military this is a model of sword that in a sense I've always wondered why they didn't just make that regulation for everyone, uh, because it's kind of perfect, okay? Um, and to my way of thinking, that perfect model of sword is the 1821 heavy cavalry officer's sword. Um, in this case, with the uh, 1845 pattern fullered blade. So as I spoke about in my last video that I think I, I did on uh, British military swords, I made the argument that because this is an 1845 pattern blade, I don't really think we should call these 1821 pattern swords because they're not. The blade's the most important part of this weapon. So it, actually it's an 1845 pattern sword with an 1821 guard. I personally would just refer to this, and I might start referring to it in the future as an 1845 pattern heavy cavalry officer's sword because that's really what it is. This is quite different to the one that went previously with a pipe back blade. Now why do I think this is so good? Well first of all I'm not going to talk that much about the blade I'm going to focus on the hilt in this video but this is a very good compromise blade. It's not that dissimilar to backsword blades um, that went before not really that di dissimilar to a whole bunch of types of blades that went before and it just works really well. It's pretty good at cutting. In fact, I would say very good at cutting. Um, cuts, these sharpened up, and this is actually a sharpened one. These cut as well as quite a lot of other types of swords out there, to be honest, if they're well sharpened. Um, and it's also pretty good at thrusting. It has a spear point, that is a centrally located point, uh, symmetrical point. Uh, and it's quite light, quite nimble. It's a good combination of sort of uh, um, enough kind of weight and heft that you can get a decent amount of cut out of it. But equally, it's nimble enough that you can kind of, you know, fight with the thing, fence with the thing, without having to have an offhand weapon to defend yourself with, such as a shield or a buckler. Um, so it's a good compromise design um, and was, you know, in use for, uh, what, for more than 50 years, really. Well, we say it's still in use for parade purposes, but... Um, um, by and large, certainly for the infantry, it was in use for 50 years um, during a period when they were actually kind of used, not that infrequently. Um, so, blade aside, I said I wasn't going to talk about the blade, let's just talk about the hilt. So, I kind of think that this is pretty much an optimum hilt. You could, one of the only ways you could really improve it, to my way of thinking, is putting a leather liner inside it, which would help against kind of wear and tear against your hands, should that happen, and potentially against blades somehow getting through any of these holes. But I have to say one of the things that makes this design so good is that those holes are small enough and shaped in such a way that it's going to be difficult for, let's just make it focus on the sword rather than my face, uh, it would make it fairly difficult for blades to come through there, you know, on uh, like certainly not on a regular blade. Very, very rare, I think, that a blade would get through there. But if you put a leather liner in, then it wouldn't get through at all. And you do get leather liners on some of these. Um, some of you might go, Matt, what about the scroll hilt? Uh, so the cinder regular cavalry pattern, what became the uh, Royal Engineers? I don't have one to hand. Oh, I do actually. Um, <laughs> as you know, I've got a lot of swords around here. Uh, so that's a Royal Engineers sword. This is in brass, but you could get them in steel as well. Uh, so that is also an excellent pattern of guard, um, but uh, this is later. So my argument or my statement is governed partly by the fact that these were already around in 1821. So given that these were around just after the Napoleonic Wars, and they do descend from a style of office, heavy cavalry officer's hilt that was around in the Napoleonic Wars, given that that hilt was already around, um, 
you know, really the basic form of it around by, by the Napoleonic uh, era, by um, 1796. But this particular version of it, the updated version, 1821, why didn't they just put this guard on all swords, basically? You know, like, um, if we take a, let's take a three-bar hilt here, okay, so you can see that this has got a three-bar hilt. This is for the light uh, cavalry and the artillery. Why didn't they just give them these? And in fact, they did in 1896. So you'll sometimes see, if you look at my uh, Eastern Antique Arms, my um, selling website, you'll notice sometimes I refer to swords as 1896 pattern. You might think, well, that looks like an 1821 pattern hilt to me. The only real difference is that in 1896, this pattern of hilt became standard regulation for all members of, uh, all officers of cavalry, so light and heavy. Um, and there was one other small change to the back strap, so rather than just having a checkered piece here for the thumb, it became fully checkered and a bit straighter, but that's a fairly minor difference really. But the guard became universal for all cavalry officers, with a few exceptions. Um, so, they did recognise this is a very good guard. Why is it such a good guard? It's thick steel, it is perforated, which makes the steel lighter, uh, makes the guard lighter as it were, and enables you to have a guard made of thicker, more robust steel. It looks nice, um, and it's more symmetrical than some other guards that were around. Why do you want a symmetrical guard? Well, quite simply, there's a certain amount of um, balance in the hand that you can feel, particularly when you're giving a cut. And if a guard projects a lot more on one side than the other, it can have a tendency to turn, especially if, you've got, um, if you haven't got a great grip um, on, the, on the weapon, um, grasp on the weapon then it can have a tendency of turning the cut slightly, meaning you don't strike true with the edge. Okay, so symmetrical guards do have their benefits. Uh, they don't have to look the same on both sides, they just have to have the same amount of mass on each side. Now this isn't exactly symmet symmetrical, this guard, but it is closer to symmetrical than lots of other guards around. It is so close to symmetrical that you, it's imperceptible really, the fact that there's slightly more weight on one side than the other. Um, Whereas, and once again to contrast with the three bar hilt, you'll see it is more asymmetrical. It has a lot more guard on one side than on the other side. So a lot more on the kind of knuckle side and a lot less on the thumb side. So some people might say, okay Matt, well that's, uh, you can understand why a bowl guard is more protective than a three bar hilt or even a simple knuckle bow as found on um, earlier Hussar kind of, you know, 1796 light cavalry sabres and things like this, or indeed medieval cross hilts and this kind of stuff. So a, a form of bowl hilt is obviously more protective than those. It's less protective than a basket hilt, but as I've spoken about before, the disadvantage of basket hilts is, number one, they can slightly be more difficult to get your hand in quickly, which is something George Silver even talks about in 1599. But additionally, they're more weight. A basket hilt is bigger and heavier, takes up more space, it's more inconvenient to wear. But additionally, it, limits, it can limit your hand uh, positioning and uh, your manipulation of the weapon. So generally speaking, these kind of bowl hilts, sabre hilts that you find on uh, sabres, and cutlasses are a good combination between almost maximum protection for almost maximum flexibility uh, in, in sort of handling of the weapon and ease of access of the weapon. And some people might say, well Matt, if a bowl hilt's so good, why not just have a sheet bowl hilt like you find on a cutlass? Well, indeed, and that's essentially what they did. And if we go to the later 1899, this one's actually for sale on my um, website at the moment, uh, if you look at this 1899 pattern you can see that essentially it, by 1899 and to some degree earlier than that uh, with the 1864 uh, 82 and 85 and 1890 patterns, but I've just happened to pick up an 1899, they did go for a hilt which is more similar for, uh, and these were, these were cavalry troopers swords and officer swords, what I was showing before is an officer sword, this is a trooper's sword, they're about the same period incidentally, so the cavalry troopers, the uh, enlisted men would have had these, and the officer would have had one of these, and clearly these are more expensive and a bit more fancy to make. Um, but they did eventually go for hilts for cavalry, um, and you could say for infantry from 1895 onwards, that are essentially like the uh, bowl hilt of the cutlass. And they are, you know, completely protective, because of course there's no holes, it's a simple bolt, it is symmetrical in this case, you'll notice that the cavalry one is not s completely symmetrical, although it actually has, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera, but it actually has a folded section on one side, 
which thickens up this inner edge, which means it wears less wear and tear on the uniform or the horse or whatever it's against. Uh, so it's a bit essentially reinforced on that side, but that also ad adds weight on that side. So despite the fact it doesn't project as far, if you unfolded that section, it will project out almost as far as this side. So it's quite a symmetrical guard, um, and of course it provides lots of protection. So what is the downside to just making a solid bowl like this? Well, it can look a bit boring. And don't you know, underestimate the importance of that, particularly for officers, they wanted things which looked quality and looked fancy. So if we go to later, uh, just grab out one here, later infantry officers' swords, which have forms of bowl, hilt, bowl hilts, they still put perforations and decorations in them to make them look better. But those perforations aren't only there to make the guard look more fancy and look nicer, they're also there to reduce the weight. Because clearly, like with basket hilts, the more weight you add at the back of the weapon, the less efficient it becomes, especially with a cutting weapon, that you want, your, you want the inertia to be centered up in the hitting portion of the blade, and you want the weapon as a whole to be as light as possible. So therefore, you actually want a light guard. So this is a, this is a paradox, and these, this is a push and pull factor, which always pulls you in two different directions. You want a light guard, and that's why uh, swords like medieval swords or you know kind of um, shamshirs and kiliches and things like this and indeed katanas, wakasashis, they often feel very nice in the hand because they have very minimal amount of weight at the hilt end of the weapon. Uh, so you get a lot of presence in the blade. When you start making a hilt very heavy you lose a lot of feeling in the blade. So one advantage of piercing the um, guard is to reduce weight from the guard. But there's another, and that is, if you, these are going to be equal weight guards, so if we look at the sheet steel of this uh, cutlass, and the sheet steel that the guard on the cavalry sword was made out of, this is thicker steel than the cutlass. So for equal weight, you can essentially make this perforated guard of, um, of thicker steel. Now, what advantage does that have? Well, of course, it means that against blows coming down from heavy ob objects like another cavalry sword in a quick pass during, as the horses charge past, if you both chop at each other and someone's blade smashes straight into the front of your guard, it's not going to crumple in, it's not going to deform, um, because it's made of thick steel and the perforations are there, meaning that you can use thicker steel whilst keeping the same weight or mass. Um, so one of the issues that you sometimes get with big sheet guards like this um, hilt on the 1899 is that they can be bent and in fact with the antiques you often find them bent and deformed because they're so big and having no perforations to keep the weight down you have to make them of thinner steel so they become a, a, a thinner sheet basically and more easily deformed. Later on, and I'll grab another sword because it's I can see it is available. The uh, 1908 ends up with a bowl hilt, which is reinforced on the edge edges with rolled edges, as you can see. It's also massive, and it has no perforation. So this is a hugely protective hilt. So what's the what do you lose? Well, what you lose is nimbleness. This is a really heavy weapon. So you've with the 1908, you've got a heavy blade, you've got a heavy hilt. It is a point centric weapon. Obviously, you can see. But moving this thing around, if this were a cutting weapon, it's just horribly unwieldy. Oh, it's just nasty to try and cut with. And you've got no real feeling in the blade because the hilt is so heavy. When you hold it, it feels like, a bit like you're holding a dumbbell. Okay, It feels like you're ha holding a dumbbell that just happens to have a blade sticking out of the end of it. So coming back to the original point, I think that uh, in the 19th century, they should really <laughs> have just copied this hilt. They didn't need to invent the cinder regular cavalry hilt that became the Royal Engineers hilt. They didn't need the infantry officer's hilt or the three bar hilt for the light cavalry and artillery. They could, and in my view should, have just given everybody this guard because it's an absolutely great guard. And you know, let's ignore the blade for now. Even if you don't like this blade, you could have had a broader blade, a curved blade, a straight blade, a thrusting blade, whatever. This hilt is a really, really good hilt for cutting and thrusting. And if you put a leather liner in it, I think it's basically perfect. So there we go. I hope that's been <laughs> provided some interesting insights into my views on 19th century British military sword design. I am a big, big fan of the um, 1821 pattern heavy cavalry sword, or I would actually say 1845 pattern heavy cavalry sword, but anyway, the heavy cavalry officer's sword. And its later version, what's often known as the 1896 pattern um, cavalry officer's sword. I'm a very, very big fan of those. Um, 
any blade variant you want, great, great guard, great hilt, uh, and particularly when you get the fully checkered backstrap in 1896, I think it's basically perfect at that point. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching, give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. See you folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!